Hello and welcome. I am Scrubberlock and this is City of Heroes on the Rebirth server. This is a Let's Rant with Scrubberlock. We're with Psyop, who's level 7. And we're doing Hollow's missions. We're talking to Flux here. And we've got to go defeat 10 outcasts with our Stalker. Um, we're level 7, heading toward level 8. And that's what we need to do to get our flight power, because I was a bonehead. And I got super excited to get Assassin's Psyblade, which I, you know, love having Assassin Strike, but I forgot to get my movement power at level 6, and that was stupid. So, uh, yeah, we'll have to rectify that at level 8. So this is a Let's Rant, and today uh, we're going to talk about, I don't know if it's really a rant, but I, I guess maybe it is. But today what we're going to talk about is alignment. Um, I've mentioned this in other... Let's plays, but today I want to really talk about it and um, do a sort of a deep dive. As I mentioned in a previous episode, I've been reading, in fact, I just finished reading a book called Arbiter of Worlds by Alexander Macris, which is sort of a guide to like how to be a good game master. And he does a really good job of explaining a lot of things. And in the back, he has an appendix where he talks about interpretations of alignment and he has some of the best uh, ways of explaining and describing the different alignments of Dungeons and Dragons, Pathfinder, and the various other games out there in a way that I think is really very clear, and um, and I think it it does a better job of it than than I've done, and it does a better job of it than I've seen done in other places, including in like the Dungeon Master's Guide of D&D. So uh, he starts by talking about the law axis chaos. What's the difference between lawful and chaotic characters? And what does neutral mean on the law chaos axis? So let's sort of, before I do that, let's back up a little bit. And for anybody who might not know, um, if you're new to tabletop role playing and D&D in particular, Going all the way back to the original Dungeons and Dragons in 1974 or 5 or whenever the, the three books came out in the original box set long before AD&D, long before Basic and Expert set, um, characters had an alignment and your alignment was almost sort of like your allegiance to one side or the other and the possible sides were law and chaos and neutrality. And the idea here was that basically civilization was represented as law, right? And the forces arrayed against civilization, monsters and such, were represented as chaos. So the things that wanted to, the monsters that wanted to destroy human towns and elven forests things like goblins and undead and trolls and stuff were chaotic and the things that were trying to keep civilization going and uh, law and order going the elves and the humans and the dwarves were generally represented as being lawful now as a player character you could be anything you wanted but that was sort of the dichotomy that Gary Gygax set up in Dungeons and Dragons and then of course in terms of um, neutrality, this is somebody who has charted a course in between those two. So uh, Macris tar starts with the law chaos axis. And what he suggests is that the law chaos axis can be represented by uh, what he calls deontologism and consequentialism. And I really like this way of describing it. So what he explains is that deontological thinking means that you think that the process by which a, an end is achieved matters more than the end. Um, the classic expression of this type of thinking is it's not whether you win or lose, it's how you play the game right the end of whether you win or lose is less important than the fact that you played the game with honor and distinction and integrity and so forth and so that's a 
deontological thinking. So somebody who is lawful is someone who thinks that what matters isn't whether you win or lose, it's how you played the game. And it may also be someone who would say, it would be someone who would say that the end doesn't justify the means, right? That the means matters more than the ends. It's not okay to murder a bunch of people to get what you want, right? So that is a, um, a lawful person they judge the morality of an action based on whether that action follows a set of predetermined rules, right? A set of values, right? The rules of the game. It's not whether you win or lose, it's how you played the game. Did you follow the rules, right? Did you play a fair game? Did you cheat? That's what matters rather than winning and losing. On the other hand, a consequentialist judges the rightness, the morality of an action based on its outcomes, based on its results, right? Did it lead to a positive result? This is the ends justify the means, right? The uh, end of winning the race justified taking the illegal shortcut or what have you, right? Um, so that is chaos, right? The, the pre-existing rules have no value. What matters is the outcome. Now you can still be a good person, right? You're trying to achieve a good end, right? But what you care about is the outcome of the action, not the, uh, whether you follow a set of methods. Right? So what matters to a consequentialist is the ends, not the means. And what matters to a lawful person is the means rather than the ends. It doesn't mean you don't care about the ends, but you're, you want to achieve your ends by following a set of rules if you're a lawful person. And if you're a chaotic person, you're not interested in the rules, you're interested in the outcome. Then for a neutral person, the neutral person sort of charts the middle course, right? They probably will follow the rules if they don't have a particular reason to break them. They don't have a disdain for the rules the way the chaotic person might. But they will break the rules if they think it's important enough to do so. So a great example of this is, um, and I think I might have told this story before, when I was playing Silver Phoenix on the Homecoming server with my roleplay oriented group, um, they used to have in-character story arc nights. We would pick a story arc and try to run all the way through it in a single evening, if we could, as a group. Usually a group of eight, a lot of people would show up. But we did it in character. We, we roleplayed, we talked in character about the mission, and we were playing the mission in character. And so at um, level 50, there is a story arc that I think both heroes and villains can somehow do. I'm not sure how the villains get hold of it, but in Dark Astoria, you can do a story arc that is, it's kind of a, shall we say, a quote unquote, a neutral story arc, right? The idea is you work with the villains, the villains work with the heroes, and you're working together to stop this like banished, I think it's a banished pantheon god named Mott, if I remember right, who's trying to come into the world and you're trying to stop him from doing that, right? And the first mission is to um, go into the ziggurat, which is the prison, and break a Malta spy out of prison because the Malta spy has the information that you need for the next step, but he won't give you the information unless you let him out of jail and the police won't let him out of jail because he's been convicted and he's got to serve his time. And so you have to break into the ziggurat, break him out of the jail, and you ultimately end up fighting uh, Blue Steel, who is the police officer that trains you up in King's Row. Um, I, this character's probably been to him. Many of my characters were there. And so 
when I heard that this was the mission, I said, wait a minute, hold on. Um, I don't think Silver Phoenix, in character, would do this. She's not going to break a crook out of prison. She's not going to fight the police. Right? This is not something she would do. This is not a means that she would follow. She would not take these steps because she is a lawful character. And to her, the process you follow to fight Mott matters as much as fighting him. Now, the hero group, the players who were the heroes, said, we understand your reluctance, and we too are reluctant, but we have to do whatever it takes to stop Mott. And I said, do whatever it takes. That's the siren song of the villains a lot of the time, right? But what they were expressing was this more neutral viewpoint that normally, yes, we would not break someone out of the ziggurat. But in this case, the god Mott is so bad, and what he's going to do is so bad, that it's worth breaking some rules to stop him. Okay, so that's kind of the neutral view. So again, to sum up, a lawful character thinks that the, the process you use to achieve the ends is at least as important, if not more important, than the end itself. That you don't gain anything by achieving a purpose while compromising your morality, your principles, whatever you want to call it. The chaotic person is a consequentialist and only thinks about the ends, right? Is perfectly willing to break the rules. The rules are not important to them. What matters is the results. If you get the result, the, a good result, a positive result, an ethical result, whatever, then that's what matters. And a neutral person will usually follow the rules as long as the rules aren't a problem, but is willing to break the rules for, a, a, for the right reasons. Right? So... I always remember a one of my English teachers, Miss ZD, her name was, not not like the food, it was spelled Z-E-A-D-Y, um, when I was a freshman in high school. I remember her talking about how moralists sometimes argue that stealing isn't wrong if you're like a starving person stealing a loaf of bread and you need the bread to live. And as long as you only steal as much as you need, that the morality of survival says that you should be able to take enough bread to live on. And um, that's kind of the neutral view, right? The lawful view would say, don't care how hungry you are, this bread is somebody else's, they own it, not you, you're not allowed to steal. The neutral view would be, well, you shouldn't be stealing more bread than you need, and you shouldn't be stealing if you have the money to buy the bread. But if you have no money and you need the bread to survive and you'll die of starvation if you don't steal the bread, it's okay to steal the bread, right? And the chaotic person would be like, screw it. If you're strong enough to take the bread, take it. What matters is that you ate, right? So those are kind of, uh, that's, I think, a good way to think about lawful, neutral, and chaotic on the law chaos scale that lawful people care about the means more than the end chaotic people care about the end more than the means and neutral people are sort of in between on that then if you look at good versus evil um somebody i can't remember who that that uh, macris based this on said you can picture kind of morality as a set of concentric expanding circles with yourself in the center. And as you go further out from the center, we've leveled up, so we're about to get our movement power. As you go further out from the center, you go further and further from yourself in relationship. So your immediate family, your distant family, your neighbors, 
your friends, your neighbors, your town, your tribe, your nation, the world. And you can picture this landscape in three dimensions. It, it goes outward in concentric circles, but also much the way we're standing on a hill here, there can be some vertical relief, right? And he said that a, a good person has a flat landscape. They consider um, the circles to be pretty much equal and they're willing to sacrifice themselves for others, even total strangers on the other side of the world, because they don't consider any point on the concentric circles to be higher than the other points, right? So they, they pretty much treat everybody equally in terms of their willingness to sacrifice, their willingness to give to others, right? And so you get someone who's willing to sacrifice their life to save the world. A neutral person is, has their concentric, you can think of their concentric circles as being kind of shaped like a hill, right? They're on the top of a hill with themselves in the center. And the most important thing, of course, is them. And then as you go down the hill, you're getting further away from self. And then you have family and then you have neighbors and then you have, you know, town and then you have tribe and nation and world right and world is way down at the bottom of the hill you're not going to really probably sacrifice for the world but you might sacrifice for your town and I, apparently there's an old maxim that says something like me before my brother me and my brother before our cousin me my brother and my cousin before my neighbors me my brother my cousin and my neighbors before the world right and so the idea is you care the most and you sacrifice the most for those that are near you in relation and you sacrifice the least for those that are further away so a neutral person would probably sacrifice for their family and their friends they would probably sacrifice they might sacrifice for their neighbors but they're going to be increasingly reluctant to sacrifice of themselves for, say, the, their country or their race or the world, right? They're going to be increasingly reluctant the further away it goes. Finally, you have an evil person. The evil person is selfish, right? Their hill is basically like a, like a tower with them at the top. They're, they're in the center and their interest in everybody else drops straight like a stone. They might perhaps be um, willing to sacrifice for their immediate family or their few actual friends, but they're not sacrificing for anybody else. And in many cases, the evil person isn't really sacrificing for family or friends. They're just, they're just, they're willing to do things for them because they're useful right and as soon as they're not useful anymore the will any willingness to do anything on their behalf goes away so um that's the way you can view good neutral and evil right good is the flat landscape where all the circles everyone in each part of every circle is sort of e even and equal and i'm will just as willing to sacrifice for somebody on the other side of the world as i am to sacrifice for my brother um, neutral is a, like a hilltop where the further away you get from me, the less willing I am to sacrifice for you. And then evil is a tall tower where I'm basically only willing to sacrifice for myself and I won't sacrifice for anybody else. And so now you can kind of put those things together in Dungeons and Dragons. We, we name you by both the law chaos axis and the good evil axis right so um now this is me continuing the metaphor because macris goes off into the weeds um to start talking about other games but um a lawful good person is someone who would um who would sacrifice for 
those anywhere in the world, but he's going to follow the rules, right? He's not going to break the rules to save people on the other side of the world or to save himself or to save his own family, right? So he's certainly willing to sacrifice, but he's going to follow rules, right? He's going to do it in the right way. A chaotic good person would say all that matters in the sacrifice is you no know, all that all that matters in the sacrifice for uh, the other side of the world is that you succeeded at it, right? So if you think about like the uh, second Avengers movie, um, and uh, there. Sokovia, the town, is like floating in space in, in, the, in the atmosphere and it's going higher and higher and they can't stop it and um, they realize, Black Widow and Captain America kind of realize it's a losing battle and, they, and they're not going to be able to win and Captain America says I'm not going to abandon these people and Black Widow says I didn't, I didn't say we should abandon them and then she look at the clouds and everything and she says it's, it's not such a bad way to die right so what she's expressing there is there's the, the results are a failure at that point as far as they know they did not achieve their ends but they're achieving they're using the means right we are doing we are fighting the honorable fight on behalf of these people and maybe we're going to lose but we're fighting this honorable fight we're using this honorable method right process on behalf of total strangers on the literally other side of the world from us from where they live right because they're americans or at least cap is black but it's russian um we're got we've got traveled to the other side of the world to save total strangers that we never met and we're not actually going to succeed at it but it's not such a bad way to die because we are using the proper methods right the means is heroic and we are helping those who cannot help themselves on the other side of the world. So the circle is all the way out the way a good person is and they're using the proper means to do it, right? So despite the fact that Black Widow usually wouldn't be thought of as lawful good, what she's expressing there is sort of a lawful good sentiment. Um... So that's lawful good. So chaotic good would say um, there is no point to making that sacrifice if you can't save them. What is the point of dying along with them? You can't save them anyway. You didn't succeed. Only the results matter, right? There's no value to fighting this fight if you can't win. Um, and the neutral good would say, well, in this case, maybe it's worth it to fight against the odds, even though you can't win. But in other cases, it, it might not be. It depends on the circumstances. Right. So it's a much more circumstantial type of morality. Lawful evil would be selfish, but care about the way things are done. Right. So you could think of a villain who has some sort of a sense of honor. And would say, I had a villain named Overlord like this. He was lawful evil, right? He was selfish. He was achieving his own ends. At one point, he tried to sacrifice every life on earth to create a power for himself to be, elevate himself to godhood so he could fight Darkseid, who was his enemy, um, is sort of one villain against the other. And he was perfectly willing to sacrifice every human being on earth to do that. But in the process, he kept his word. He didn't lie. He played fair. He fought fair against the heroes. He wouldn't cheat against them, right? He wouldn't. He wasn't deceptive of them to them, right? So he had standards, and he would not violate those standards. But he was incredibly selfish, and he didn't care about anybody but himself, right? So his his circle was a circle of one, right? And so that's lawful evil. And then chaotic evil is selfish evilness, right? But there is only the results matter. 
right? So a chaotic evil person would be perfectly willing to lie, cheat, steal, and be dishonorable to achieve their goals, and they would sacrifice everybody while they're lying, cheating, stealing, etc. That a neutral evil person would make the determination sort of on the fly as to whether they're willing to compromise their standards or not. And sort of very interestingly, and I think quite accurately, if you watch the Chain of Acheron D&D stream with Matt Colville, in one of the early episodes, I only watched, I think, the first four or five. So somewhere in those first few episodes, um, Anna Coulter is playing Judge, who is a tiefling anti-paladin called an ill rigger and he worships Asmodeus. So he's a devil, and the devils are in D&D traditionally, although they're changing alignment now. We're not going to get into that. Um, but traditionally in D&D, the devils are lawful evil, and demons are chaotic evil, and they don't like each other. They have a, a war and all this. And so... Um, I can't remember exactly how the conversation went, but one of the players express the idea that um that you can't you can't trust demons and that the demons are because they're evil or something like that and anna said at being like playing the devil guy that she was playing well you know you can't trust devils you can't necessarily trust devils either but we have standards right that the difference between demons and devils is that the devils have standards and the demons don't. Okay. And that's basically the same thing that Macris was saying, right? To the devils, and we got to remember to get our movement power, to devils, how you go about being evil matters at least as much as the result of being evil, right? Of the evil result that you're doing. How you go about doing it matters. And um, to a demon, how you go about doing it doesn't matter at all. They're just indiscriminately evil and they don't have any standards. They don't care how you do it. They just want the, only the result matters. Right, whereas to a devil, the manner in which you went about being evil might actually matter a lot more. Um, and of course, being neutral, a neutral evil character would be sort of in between. They might care a little bit about the means you use to uh, go about being evil, but probably not a lot. Right. So anyway, that's alignment. Uh, how long has this episode been? Okay, we're about a half hour. I think this, this is actually, we got our movement power. I think this is actually a good place to stop. So we're going to join Flux here. There he is. So this is a safe spot. I think this is a good place to stop. We've got our movement power. We're level eight. And um, we've completed our discussion about alignment. Hopefully that helps you guys um, as you think about alignment for your character. Right, lawful good and chaotic good and neutral good, lawful evil and so on. Hopefully you can think about it in terms of does the means matter or the end or somewhere in between. And you can think about it in terms of how wide and flat is your character's circle. And when you think about those two metaphors, those two ways of thinking about it, it's easy to come up with an alignment. And the last thing I want to mention before we go is that alignment is descriptive, not prescriptive, right? It doesn't, you aren't required to act a certain way because your alignment says so. However, the alignment, and I've mentioned this before, the alignment is a part of your character. It is a line on your character sheet if your game has alignment. And all parts of your character sheet must be accurate. So if you write an alignment down, say lawful good, and then what you realize is that actually this character cares more about results than about 
the process, you need to change the written alignment on your character sheet so that it more accurately describes the way you're playing the character. Right? You should think about how you're going to play the character and write an accurate description, but characters evolve during gameplay, and if it turns out that this character you thought was going to care a lot about methods has had to compromise their principles about methods over and over again in order to win battles and defeat enemies, you might realize that this character is actually much more results focused than you thought and change their alignment on the character sheet to more accurately reflect that. You should always make sure that your character sheet accurately reflects the truth about your character, just like you should have the right number of arrows in your quiver and you should have the right sword written down and you should have written down which magic items you're attuned to correctly and all of that and the right spells you should have the correct alignment that properly describes your character just like you have the hair color and the eye color and so on if your character had something happen it was a blue-eyed character and you had something happen that transformed your eye color to brown you would change the description on your character sheet to read brown eyes similarly if your character is if you thought they had a flat landscape and they were good, but you find out during the process of roleplay that they really care more about themselves and the party and not anybody else, then you might have to change their alignment from good to neutral, right? Or if they care about the means more than you thought, you might change their alignment from neutral to lawful. This doesn't mean that anything magical is changing about the character. This isn't a helm of alignment change. It's just you making sure that all of the descriptions, all of the stats, everything on your character sheet is accurate to the best of the possible ability of its description about your character. So if you think of alignment as a description and you think of it in terms of ends and means and in terms of the circle and the shape of your circle landscape, I think it can help come up with what the right description is for your character and then uh, alignment really shouldn't be an issue in most games. Uh, feel free to leave comments if you have any questions or if you want to debate about exactly how I've defined and Macris has defined um, alignment. And until next time, I am Scrapperlock, and this has been Let's Rant with Scrapperlock.